Hi, I'm Jim Emke with Feed the Future. I'd like to talk to you today about agricultural transformation. Agriculture provides the best opportunity we have to reduce poverty and hunger among the greatest number of people in the world. The process by which agriculture does this is known as agricultural transformation. There's a lot of political interest in agricultural transformation right now. It's a cornerstone of the U.S. government's global food security strategy. It is the top-line goal of the African Union's Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation. It is implicit and explicit in the Sustainable Development Goals. We know that we want to transform from subsistence farming to commercial agriculture but the agricultural transformation process is more complex than that. So we have to ask the question, what are we really transforming? What is it that we hope to achieve? What do you hope to achieve in the country where you work? If you believe that the greatest challenge to agriculture is producing enough food to feed a burgeoning world population, then you may want an agricultural transformation that focuses on agricultural productivity and production, that focuses on staple crops such as wheat, maize, and rice, that invests heavily in inputs and in mechanization. If you believe that the greatest challenge to agriculture is to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, then you may want to invest into an integrated agriculture or agroforestry system that has some staple crops, but also a number of tree crops and the opportunities for carbon sequestration. If you believe that the greatest threat to mankind's current livelihood is the sixth great extinction, where species are going extinct today at 1,000 times the historical rate, so the issue isn't whether we as the human race is going to become extinct. The issue is that our livelihood depends directly and indirectly on a number of species who are at threat of extinction. Then you might want to invest in ecologically sustainable agriculture. This at a minimum includes ecological buffer strips along and between farms, and you may want to move away from monocropping entirely. If you believe that one of the greatest challenges to the food system will be feeding people in coastal cities subject to extreme weather events, then you might want to think about alternatives, such as investing in rural small towns and secondary cities. These localities can become the hub of a significant food system, creating employment, providing food for both urban areas and for smallholders, and require an investment that goes beyond the traditional agriculture. There may be additional threats or opportunities that are peculiar to your country. There may be employment issues. You may want a transformation that promotes gender equality. You may want to think about nutritional transition. But whatever the issues that are most important in the country or where you work, there are multiple drivers of transformation that can help to address the priority issues. Next, we'll talk a little bit about these drivers. There may be other issues in your country that are very specific to the agricultural transformation that you want to see and you want to help take place in that country. These issues could include employment, it could include improved nutritional outcomes, it could include improved gender outcomes. It could include agricultural's contribution to alleviating the food insecurity in urban slums. Policy plays a critical role in agricultural transformation. And I'm going to give you two examples of different policy regimes within successful agricultural sectors that have had significant positive and some negative outcomes. Brazil has ridden growth in its agricultural sector to become the world's third largest agricultural exporter and eighth largest economy. Agricultural achievements include a doubling of food production, a poverty rate that is 3.7 percent, and very low stunting and underweight in the country. 
Niger is a very different country, which is focused on its ecology and has reclaimed over 5 million hectares of desertified land and put that back into agriculture. That is one third of the currently available arable land within the country. As a result of this, Niger has also more than doubled food production and has made significant improvements in declining its poverty rate and in declines in its stunting and underweight. Yet there are negative consequences to both of these agricultural transformations. In Brazil, the negative consequences center around the ecology and deforestation in the Mato Grosso and Cerrado. In Niger, despite yield increases, despite improvements in poverty, agriculture is still one of the least productive agricultures in the world. Poverty rates are still among the highest in the world. And with the minimal rainfall that Niger gets, agriculture will continue to be a challenge for the foreseeable future. The question for you is, are there significant policy lessons and best practices that you can take from Brazil or Niger or other countries and apply to the agricultural transformation that you are supporting in your country? Today's agricultural transformations will be different from what we saw in the 1960s and the Green Revolutions for four reasons. The first of those reasons is the declining real prices of agricultural foods, in particular staple foods. So the prices of wheat, rice, and maize, as received by the farmer, are about one-third to one-quarter today that they were in 1960. That means that your technical innovations today that increase yields for smallholders will have only one-third to one-quarter the effect on the smallholder's income that the same sort of innovation had in the 1960s. The second reason why today's agricultural transformations will be different are the demographics. So you've heard about the youth bulge in Africa and in some of the South Asian countries, but there is no youth bulge, there is an explosion. If you look at the demographics, the number of young people in African and sub-Saharan African countries will double over the next couple decades. And we have to find food for these people. We have to find jobs as these people enter the workforce. We have to find ways for them to have sustainable livelihoods. And those all will affect the path of your agricultural transformation. The third reason why today's transformations will be different is deindustrialization. Deindustrialization is the idea that robotics, artificial intelligence, and mechanization are replacing manufacturing jobs worldwide. We can no longer take a farmer, move him off the farm into a high-wage manufacturing job in an urban area because those high-wage jobs are not growing and maybe even disappearing. So we have to find an agricultural transformation that provides a different set of livelihood options for smallholders. The fourth reason why today's agricultural transformation will be different from what you have seen in the past is the lengthening food supply chains. So they are lengthening both in terms of their geography, there is global reach of food purchases and distribution systems. Even in the most rural parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, you see smallholders purchasing some amount of processed foods. And throughout the region as a whole, more than 50% of the value of food is consumed in terms of purchased foods. There is also an increase in the number of perishable foods, again, by value more than 50% of the value is in perishable foods. And we are also seeing a lengthening of supply chains in terms of the degree of processing. Where these food markets work well, they work very well. And even at very low income levels, you see smallholders changing their diet in order to take advantage of the opportunities that a food market presents them. And this is a critical part of agricultural transformation. As we ask smallholders to move from subsistence farming to commercial agriculture, we are asking them to rely on markets to provide their food. And so we need to invest in market systems that provide access to affordable, sustainable, diverse, nutritious foods for all of the population. Where markets don't work well, there is a big issue. In the case of Rwanda, 
even the highest people in the highest income level cannot afford to purchase a sufficiently diverse and nutritious diet, in part because Rwanda is a very poor country, but in part also because the food market system in Rwanda is underdeveloped and the government is working very hard with the private sector to develop it, but these things do not happen overnight. So we want agricultural transformations that can provide sufficient and nutritious foods to the entirety of the population. These differences between what happened in the Green Revolution and what is happening today are taken into account by the global food security strategy. So for example, the share of the consumer dollar that goes back to the farmer, even in sub-Saharan Africa, is less than 50 percent. It's probably less than 30 percent in Asia. That means that we are continuing to emphasize helping the smallholder farmer increase productivity and move to commercial agriculture, but we are also emphasizing improving the food system, the 50 to 70 percent of the food system value that occurs off the farm. In the case of bread, for example, in South Africa, the farmer receives 12 to 18 cents on the dollar of bread. How do we, in fact, then help the food system reduce the costs, provide more access to bread, make it more affordable, make it more nutritious by investing in food systems that deal with the, the 82 to 88 percent of the bread cost that occur off the farm. So then my questions to you are, what are the key food systems levers that you can pull in your country to improve the food system and contribute to agricultural transformation? So we've seen four important reasons why today's agricultural transformation will be different from what you saw in the 1960s in the Green Revolution. For your country, there may be additional differences. There may be other trends that are important in what you can and can't do to foster and accelerate agricultural transformation. So what I'd like you to do is just take a minute now and think about what are three to four key trends that are affecting the way agricultural transformation is or could unfold in your country. And then I'd like for each of those trends you to think about what would your response be in order to take advantage of opportunities that are afforded by this trend or to remediate negative consequences that might arise because of this trend. So we started out asking what kind of agricultural transformation does your country want? And now we've moved into how do you adjust your Feed the Future programming in order to meet those transformation priorities? And there are a number of ways in which we have seen that you may be able to do this. One is to invest in on-farm productivity. One is to invest in off-farm value chain productivity. Another is to focus on rural employment. Another is to focus on food systems development. Another is to focus on rural urban linkages, including sustainable rural communities and small towns. Another is to focus on the nutritional outcomes. So you've seen by now that agricultural transformation is a complex socioeconomic process. You have a heavy lift trying to decide how to accelerate this because you are dealing with multiple stakeholders who have incomplete information. The information that is available differs across stakeholders. You have control of some of your resources. You're being asked to leverage other resources and other non-resource actions by this multiple set of stakeholders. Where do you invest? You have to be asking yourself the question, where do I invest? And so let me try to provide three frameworks for thinking about that question. The first is, what processes do I invest in? What processes do I invest in in order to bring this group of multiple stakeholders with different information and different objectives together in a coordinated and aligned fashion in order to move the sector forward? And I would offer one suggestion here, which is the mutual accountability processes. So mutual accountability is an, uh, has been endorsed by high-level forums such as the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness and the Busan Partnership Agreement. 
But it's really interesting the way it's being implemented in African agriculture and food systems. So it creates inclusive dialogue between these multiple stakeholder groups so that they can decide on where the sector might go, on a plan for moving that forward, and on the commitments that they each want to make and hold themselves and others accountable for in order to move that agricultural sector forward. And that's where the mutual accountability is, making aligned commitments and holding e ourselves and each other accountable for those commitments. The second way I want to frame this question is, where do I invest geographically? So you have options of investing on the farm, in urban areas, in linkages. And here I would make one suggestion. Let's look at some of those rural small towns and secondary cities. These are the linchpin of the food system. They are the method and, and the point by which food comes from the farm, is processed, and then is put on the consumer's table. Whether that consumer is in an urban area or whether that, cons that food is then processed and goes back to the smallholder family as a consumer. They are the method for getting grain from one part of the country and fresh fruits and vegetables to, from another part of the country to be exchanged so that all smallholders have access to both grains and fresh fruits and vegetables. So let's think about investing in methods and public goods that can improve the commercialization of the food system to serve all through those secondary cities. And then finally, I want to frame the question in terms of thematic areas for investment. So I'm going to give you two thematic suggestions here. One is the policy systems. So we are no longer catalyzing agricultural transformation by technology the way we did in the Green Revolution. Technology continues to be critically important, but what is the catalyst? It is the policy changes that unlock the power of the private sector, including smallholders, to invest in their own farms, in their own food systems, in their own food processing enterprises to make that food system grow. And then second, the investments in the food system itself so that it can become inclusive, that it can help all individuals in the country achieve a nutritious diet in an affordable fashion. So let's take about 15 minutes and ask ourselves, what can we do in each of these three areas? In terms of processes, what are the two to three most important investments that we can make in the socioeconomic processes that condition the food system? How do we, in fact, create a better space for dialogue among all participants so that participants can act more aligned and more in unison in order to move the food system forward? In terms of geography, what are the two or three most important geographies where you can make an investment in your country? Now, this doesn't have to be defined by the zone of influence. It can be local localities within the zone of influence. So you could say within my zone of influence, I'm going to focus on the rural small town or I'm going to focus on processing plants in these locations. Or it could be I'm going to focus on the movement of food from my zone of influence as it becomes a breadbasket for the country and the movement of food into urban areas or to other rural areas that are not yet breadbaskets. Finally, I'd like you to pick the two or three most important thematic areas where you can make investments. Is it policy? Is it on-farm technology development? Is it off-farm technology development? Is, is it a, a thematic area for enabling the private sector to make agricultural investments? What will benefit your country the most what can you have the greatest bang for your buck in when you invest in these areas? So let me leave you with three takeaways from this discussion. First, agricultural transformation is a complex, multifaceted phenomenon that takes many different forms. The form that it takes in your country will be determined by the multiple stakeholders who are engaged in this process in your country. Second, there are multiple drivers of agricultural transformation. Policy can be a catalytic driver of agricultural transformation.
There are different drivers, and depending on which drivers you invest in, your agricultural transformation will look different. Third, we can't get there the old-fashioned way, but we can get there, and there are plenty of opportunities to do so. One of those opportunities is to think about the balance between investing on the farm in increased farm productivity and off the farm in increased food systems that make affordable, nutritious foods available for all. There are no easy answers, but we can get there. And one way of dealing with this complex problem is to convene inclusive dialogues among the multiple stakeholders of agricultural transformation so that we can understand and address their concerns. This helps us make investments that encourage them and enable them to take advantage of opportunities and to move the sector forward. You've done a great job in representing those stakeholders in today's discussion. Thank you very much for your participation in this discussion.